Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to explore the function of the GABA-A receptor with a strong emphasis on how benzodiazepines influence or modulate the function of this GABA-A receptor. And in doing so, we'll also mention the functions of barbiturates and alcohols in this as well. So let's go over the very basic function of the GABA-A receptor. So this is the function that it has without any drugs present. So just naturally in vivo in your body right now. So certain neurons are able to generate a molecule called GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter. It actually stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. The butyric part means that it has four carbons. Butyric acid, it's actually a four carbon carboxylic acid. And if we actually label each carbon, this would be alpha, beta, and gamma. And so we have a gamma amino group, but most people just abbreviate it as GABA. And if we have a neuron that's able to release GABA, it has to be able to make GABA. And this is done through this enzymatic reaction right here. The immediate precursor to GABA is simply the amino acid glutamate. And so if, let's say, a presynaptic neuron is to make GABA, it decarboxylates glutamate via this enzyme glutamate decarboxylase, a one-step reaction that's dependent on pyridoxal phosphate, and you get GABA. And then that presynaptic neuron, if it's stimulated, can release GABA into the synaptic cleft. And then that GABA can then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and influence the postsynaptic membrane via the GABA-A receptor, a schematic of which is shown right here. So we're going to assume that this is the postsynaptic neuron and its membrane is going to have GABA-A receptors in it. Now obviously this is not what the GABA-A receptor looks like. This is really just a conceptual picture of it because it's going to illustrate not only GABA's function but also um, some of the uh, allosteric modulators such as benzodiazepines and barbiturates. Now this green part right here is the GABA sensitive part. So GABA will be released by a presynaptic neuron, diffuse across the synaptic cleft, and bind to the GABA binding sites. So portions of the GABA-A receptor have GABA binding sites. There's actually multiple GABA binding sites. It's actually not just one. There's many on each GABA-A receptor. And regardless of how many bind, when GABA binds to the receptor, it causes this channel in the middle to open and it allows chloride to move from the extracellular side to the intracellular side. In other words, it causes chloride influx into the postsynaptic neuron. All right. Now, remember that chloride is an ion that's normally at rest. It's outside the cell or it's extracellular at the highest concentration. But when GABA binds to the GABA binding sites on the GABA-A receptor, that triggers an opening of this channel within the receptor itself and chloride influxes. And so when GABA binds, you have chloride moving through the channel and it ultimately moves into the intracellular part. Now, because when this happens, you're making the inside of the cell more negative, because chloride's negative, more negative with respect to the outside of the cell, that's going to cause hyperpolarization of the membrane. And generally when we think about hyperpolarization, it means that the membrane or the cell itself becomes more inactive. Okay? Um, and from a very superficial perspective, this is why we think of GABA being associated with more relaxation or rest or sleep. Because whenever there's more GABA, you have more hyperpolarization and more inactivation of these neurons. One thing I also want to mention is that the more GABA you have binding to this receptor, because there are multiple binding sites, you could think of the wider the central channel becomes and the more chloride ions can come through. In other words, what I'm saying is that it's graded. If you have one GABA binding versus three, the case where there's three GABA binding at once, there's going to be more chloride influx than there would be if there was only one molecule of GABA binding. And so just to reiterate this, you have to have GABA binding to the GABA-A receptor. The chloride channel in the center of the receptor itself, in the center of the protein, opens in proportion to the degree of GABA binding. And then, of course, chloride influx and membrane hyperpolarization. And of course, that's what leads to the neuron itself becoming more inactive, okay? Now, that's all well and good, but 
it turns out that the GABA-A receptor is a very important therapeutic target for drugs such as benzodiazepines and the less commonly used now barbiturates and then also alcohols. Before we go any further, I want to at least talk about what benzodiazepines are, what barbiturates are, and then also the types of alcohols that we're talking about. These first two molecules are benzodiazepines. Uh, this one on the left is lorazepam, but it's more commonly known as Ativan. And then the second one is alprazolam, more commonly known as Xanax. Typically, if you went to the doctor and they prescribed these, they would usually use these trade names, Ativan and Xanax. Now, a benzodiazepine has a characteristic structure. One of the rings is a seven-membered ring, and it has these two nitrogens in it. Okay, uh, There's two carbons or three carbons between them, depending on which way you go. But this is our seven-membered ring. They also have a six-membered ring. This is actually a benzene ring that is directly connected on two positions to the seven-membered ring. And then there's another benzene ring down here that's actually connected via a covalent bond to one of the positions on the seven-membered ring. You'll notice that both of these benzodiazepines have that. There's some slight variations in the other positions, but they all have that characteristic structure. And if you see something that looks like that, chances are it is a benzodiazepine, which most people simply refer to as benzos. Now this molecule right here, this is phenobarbital. This is a classic example of a barbiturate. Now if we remove these two groups up here at the top and just look at the six-membered ring, this would be barbituric acid or barbituric acid. Barbituric acid is a six-membered ring where it goes, there's a carbon up here, carbonyl, nitrogen, carbonyl, nitrogen, carbonyl. Six-membered ring just like that. So these two groups up here would just be hydrogens and that would be barbituric acid. Barbiturates are made by basically taking those two hydrogens up at this top carbon and replacing them with other things. It just so happens that when one of them is an ethyl group and the other is a benzene, you have phenylbarbital. And you can look up a list of, of barbiturates and they'll all have different substituents up here at the top, okay, on this carbon atom. But this is a good example of a barbiturate. And generally speaking, barbiturates are not used anywhere near as much as benzos. Um, for most people that require some kind of uh, sedation uh, for sleeping or anxiety or something, I don't know of anybody who actually takes a barbiturate. Um, nowadays, everybody takes a benzodiazepine, and that's because benzodiazepines are safer than barbiturates. Now, that being said, they are weaker than barbiturates, but they are still something that you have to be very careful with because they can, you can develop tolerance to benzodiazepines and you should certainly never cut these cold turkey because they are very prone to withdrawal symptoms in the same way that most drugs are. So even like heroin, cocaine, which I don't recommend you do any of those things, but, uh, but those are certainly prone to withdrawal. Benzodiazepines are no different. Barbiturates are much stronger. And all three of these molecules, or both of these classes, are considered depressants. Not depressants in the sense like, oh, I'm sad, I'm depressed, clinically depressed. Uh, they're just depressants because what we're going to see is that they're actually going to further activate the GABA-A receptor, and they're going to depress or inactivate the neurons on which they are acting. And in terms of alcohols, there's really only two relevant ones. Those are ethanol and isopropyl alcohol, of which ethanol, you could imagine why, is the much more applicable one here. But both of those can actually modulate the GABA-A receptor. Now, it doesn't matter if we're talking about benzodiazepines or barbiturates or alcohols. Okay? They're all positive allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor. Now, what does that mean? What is an allosteric modulator? Well, allosteric modulators are just molecules that bind to what are called allosteric sites on a protein. What is an allosteric site? It is a site distinct from the normal binding site of the normal ligand. What is the normal ligand of the GABA-A receptor? It's GABA. Usually, the normal ligand of a receptor is just how the receptor is named. So we've got a GABA-A receptor, so the normal ligand is GABA. So in this green region, at least represented by the green region, this is where GABA normally binds. So the allosteric sites are at sites distinct from that. So this blue area and this orange area, these are allosteric sites. And in, according to this picture, just a representation, the blue allosteric site is for benzodiazepines, might not be able to see that. And the orange allosteric site is for barbiturates and alcohol. Okay. And so if you have a positive allosteric modulator when it binds to its particular region, 
it will increase the activity of the protein. So positive allosteric modulators increase the activity or function of the protein. Now we don't have any here, but if we had a negative allosteric modulator, when the negative one binds, it would decrease the activity or decrease the function of the protein. But with the GABA-A receptor, all the important relevant ones for the most part are positive allosteric modulators. So when any of these molecules, whether it be a benzo or a barbiturate or when alcohol uh, bind to their allosteric sites, they increase the function of the GABA-A receptor. And so that will facilitate more chloride influx than we would see if just GABA were present. And I tried to draw that with, with some perspective here. Here we just have GABA, so there's just a little chloride coming in. When we add in any of these drugs, now we have a lot of chloride influxing because they're all positive allosteric modulators, positively modulating or increasing the function of the protein, the GABA-A receptor. And so if we had to sum this up, but if you have GABA there, and if a benzodiazepine binds, or if we have a barbiturate or alcohol that bind to this allosteric site, then the chloride channel, that opening in the center, is gonna open more than it would if it were just GABA. So that's what this bullet point two means. It doesn't make a lot of sense the way I wrote it. But basically, the more benzos that you have, the more higher concentration of benzos or barbiturates or alcohol, the more that this central channel is gonna open, and the more that it opens, the more chloride is gonna come through, okay? And the more chloride that you have coming through, the more the membrane hyperpolarizes. And so this is what we're thinking about when we have higher doses of benzos or lower doses. Lower doses of benzos would not cause as much hyperpolarization. They might cause more than you would have without any benzos, but low benzos are not going to cause as much hyperpolarization as higher doses of benzos. So hopefully that makes sense. So it is a graded response. The more benzos you have, the wider this channel gets and the more chloride influx and the more inactive certain neurons become. Now, when used properly, meaning when you take them in reasonable doses and they're not abused and not cut cold turkey, benzodiazepines can be extremely therapeutic for treating things like anxiety and restlessness when you're trying to sleep. Um, for people that have trouble sleeping, these drugs can be monumentally therapeutic and powerful because sleep is extremely important. And just for the sedative effect, that can be very beneficial for some people. But like I said, you should never cut these cold turkey and you should never, ever overdose on these. So here in this picture, let's suppose that a person took way too much benzodiazepines in one dose. Okay, One dose, way too high. So these little blue things right here are representative of benzo. So you can see the benzodiazepine allosteric sites are pretty saturated with benzodiazepines. We can make the same argument with barbiturates. It takes much less barbiturates to get the same effect because those are stronger. In any case, if we have way too many benzodiazepines, then this channel is going to open way too much. And what would we expect for the chloride influx? We're going to get way too much chloride influx. And I tried to show this with, again, some perspective. When we used a reasonable amount of benzos or barbiturates, we got a reasonable amount of chloride influx. But if we use way too much of the drug, we get way too much chloride influx. And that would result in way too much hyperpolarization of these membranes. Way too much hyperpolarization, in fact, that any organ downstream that this neuron might control is going to die. It's not going to function. So for example, if this neuron, where we had way too much benzos or way too much barbiturates, if it controlled, let's say, the heart or the lungs, those organs would stop functioning. And you cannot live without a functioning heart, and you cannot live without functioning lungs. And so you would die. But the major thing that I wanted to really get across in this video is really just how the benzodiazepine functions. You have to have GABA binding to the receptor. That's a prerequisite. That must happen at the same time. The benzo won't function by itself. But if GABA is already present on the receptor, 
on its binding site, and then you have a benzodiazepine that binds as well, that chloride channel will open up a little bit more, and you'll have more chloride influx than you would if it were just GABA. And so more chloride influx equals more membrane hyperpolarization and more inactivity of particular neurons. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something in it. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.